All right, so we'll go ahead and officially kick us off here. Uh, my name is Karen Spader, and I will be kicking off our session for us. But this is a, you know, if you I know a lot of you have been to Active Teaching Labs, and we are trying to keep in the spirit of the tradition of Active Teaching Labs by really discussing, right? So this is a, a space for you to share with each other your questions, your concerns, your ideas, your solutions. Um, anything and everything. So uh, well, I'll just forge ahead. So today our general kind of umbrella topic is fostering better asynchronous collaborations while you are teaching remotely. So just by a quick show of hands, how many of you are familiar with Blackboard Collaborate Ultra? How much guidance do we need here? Everybody put that hand up and leave it up for just a second until I see if everybody's very good, very good. So we have a couple of people who haven't raised their hands. That's all right. So just, and thank you everyone, you can lower your hand if you haven't already. So um, just a quick tidbit, probably the most important is if you have questions and you don't already have this uh, session menu to your right open, that purple tab with the white arrows there, that's what you can click on, and then it will open your chat bubble, and you can post any questions you have over there. Um, we will also take an opportunity to you know, ask people if they want to speak, and there's your microphone. Uh, this camera is here to turn your video on, and most of you found that hand raiser already. And we'll look at the annotation tools. So. Generally, our format for the labs, our virtual labs, uh, will kind of present some top five takeaways on the overall umbrella topic here. Where today we're talking about fostering better asynchronous collaborations. And then we'll kind of try to fill out what are your concerns, what are your questions. And so it will be engaging in that way. We'll be asking you to share. Then we'll spend some time addressing what those are, the, particularly the common ones or the repeated ones. Um, and this is something that, again, is open to all of you. Just because we have so-called moderators in this session doesn't mean uh, the answers are limited to us. So please speak up when you have something to say. Um, we've also compiled a bunch of resources for you in the activity sheet that keeps getting shared in the chat, and we will go to that here in a moment. Um, and at the end of the session, you know, we will continue to add to those activity sheets, um, and you're welcome to add to them as well. All right. So let's get a feel for all of you. Um, up at the top, right above the slides, you'll notice uh, the annotation tools. And if you click on that T, then to the right, you'll get a color bubble, too, if you want to change the color of your font. But you just click right on this gray area and type out some concerns you have about asynchronous collaborations. I'm assuming most, if not all of you, had in-person plans for people working together in some way. Um, so what concerns do you have about turning those into the remote environment? Lack of student engagement, technology, students go on autopilot to respond to discussions. Okay, we'll talk about that. How to make them interesting and meaningful, wonderful. They feel like they take a lot of work, both instructor and student, okay. Does it take more time than synchronous learning for students and instructor? Tech failure, thinking in the moment. Can't quite read this green one. I'm going to move it up to the white, see if I can read it better. Keeping the activities lively and encouraging participation. Yeah, and you can, some people have figured this out, you can make these bigger. If you click on something with the arrow or the selection tool, and then you click on a word and drag the corner. Great, scaffolding, improving student engagement, sheer volume of response, how to make students responsible. Okay, great. So we've got a lot of internet connection. This is a really good one to point out that I hadn't really thought of addressing, but I will say that one of the nice things about asynchronous collaborations is that while you still need some kind of connection, it's certainly less uh, what's I don't I'm not, I'm not sure of the technical terms to use here. Um, less 
drain, right? Uh, yeah, there's more flexibility, thanks, John, than having to stream something live. Um, so if there's poor internet connection or poor internet qu quality, an asynchronous setup is actually going to be extremely beneficial. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at our top five takeaways today. Um, so one of the things that we're really trying to be mindful of when we prepare our thoughts for these is we're focusing on relatively easy, straightforward, simple, pretty direct ways to continue the plans that you had in place already. So how can we make it easy to foster those kinds of interactions, whether they are relatively in the moment and short-lived, like we often have in a classroom to discuss, or if they have bigger goals, like for example, larger group projects as a, as a kind of big semester project. Um, so what are some of those top five things that you can do to, to, to make those happen in the remote learning environment? And in no way would these necessarily suit everyone, right? Um, one or two or none, maybe, right, might work for you, whereas more might work for other people. So a point to discussion forums, asynchronous discussion forums, is this first one here in red, illicit connections. And a couple of the comments that I saw on that whiteboard back there were things like um, making things meaningful for students and keeping them engaged, not letting them kind of autopilot. So I think this one really speaks to some of those concerns. The prompts that we put in an asynchronous discussion forum really matter, right? Because our asynchronous interactions are different from face-to-face -face ones. In the moment when we're face-to-face, -face, we kind of have the easy and fast ability to switch trajectories and start talking about something different. Whereas in a remote environment, especially in an asynchronous environment, we have to kind of do the work of structuring that opportunity. And ultimately what that means is finding ways that people will, even from initial response, have unique takes on a topic or on a discussion. So by eliciting connections to students' own personal and or professional lives, um, it opens up that opportunity for variation in response. Different from asking students to state some kind of definition or find a fact and in those cases everybody it basically the the discussion post is a correct answer and of course that will stifle the interaction and it will be less meaningful so finding those ways to elicit in the way that we write our discussion props elicit connections between the co course content and students own lives another thing we can do is award points for participation um, one way that we've seen both uh, more and sustained, although that isn't necessarily the only way to look at a discussion forum is quality, right? So it's not just about how many posts people make, but the nature of those posts. Um, by giving points to students who are participating in those discussion forums or other interactive activities, whatever they might be, um, students might put it more effort toward those based on the time and the energy they're investing in that. Then this one kind of shifts gears into um, bigger projects, eliciting clear expectations. Certainly there are people who already have group projects going on in their courses. So when we think about what do we need to do to keep that, oh, we lost the slides, I don't know what happened. If someone could find those slides, I'll keep talking. Um, when we think about what we need to do to keep those groups moving forward when we are remote and distant from one another physically is to lay out clear expectations. And that might be things like making sure, um, when, for example, I'll use a personal example. Uh, this was a blended course I was teaching uh, over a course of a semester and students had a big project that they did but we only met a couple of times in the beginning and then once at the end and the in the middle of the term what I used that for was kind of one-on-one -on -one group meetings with the groups but they had to keep contribution logs basically each group got a Google sheet um, and every student had their name on it and then they would update that sheet whenever they made some kind of contribution to the group project while they were uh, in the remote or online atmosphere 
So little things that we can do to just kind of establish those clear expectations and make sure that students are regularly checking in and however we can make those account students accountable to that. And what are called group charters often work for that. They're really nothing more than a explicit um, plan put in place for participating with their group members. It's often even better to have students themselves contribute to the guidelines that they have in their own group charter. Then we've got uh, a tool, a tool that can be helpful for encouraging group collaboration, which is the Canvas groups. Um, and basically when you set up a group in Canvas, you give students their own space on, I always refer to it as a subset of Canvas. So you have your main Canvas course, but when you set up groups in that, students get a group space attached to your Canvas course that gives them essentially instructor level access to tools. So they can share files, they can create pages, they can create uh, discussion forums and collaborations. So it gives them that space with uh, all the power of the tools that Canvas has available. And then Another point is to just think about variety in, in the activities that we offer our students. Discussion forums in Canvas are not the only way to get students interacting and engaging collaboratively, even in an asynchronous environment. And so we've got lots of examples of that in the activity sheet. Um, but having them curate resources together, allowing them to share via text or via video or audio, um, or mixed media, right? So giving them those opportunities to engage in ways that they are able to uh, demonstrate their strengths and or improve their skills can go a long way for engaged and meaningful collaborative activities. All right, so we're turning to you now. Uh, JT just shared in the chat the link to the activity sheet. And if you could go into this activity sheet and scroll down to the what do you want to learn section, uh, we will start to hear from you. What, what do you want to learn? What questions do you have about improving asynchronous collaborations that you have planned for your classes? I'm going to switch gears and share my screen while you type. Jean, did you have a question? On here while I wasn't watching. Jean, yeah, did Jean, you have yeah. a question? Yep, this is Jeannie Ferguson. Um, in line with that slide that you that has now disappeared, the one you were speaking from, um, thinking about <clears throat> a, a strategy to create more ownership in students in their small group sessions, such as, and I don't know if anybody's done this, if it if it would work, to have them choose what their high stakes and low stakes. Um, investments might be. I might think a high stake investment is writing a paper um, because it's worth 15 or 20 points. But a student who isn't very expressive in that way might much prefer to have more points and more investment in dedication to their discussion posts, for example. Does that make sense to have almost individualized um, point structures for students if they choose that where they can feel like they own where they're going to do their best learning. Mm -hmm. What do people think about that? If, that, if I've made that make sense. It did. Um, and I think that, I think there's a lot to be said here. Um, one, the, the, if you will, the technical navigation of, um, of assessing that and how a grade is determined in that way and I think there are a lot of ways to do that and I don't want to go deep into exploring that necessarily right now. I actually think it's an excellent idea assuming that there's some so what if one student said, okay, well, I want my high stakes to be engagement in the discussion board. Is that equivalent to someone saying, I want my high stakes to be writing a 10-page paper? 
how do you find balance in that um, in terms of just energy and investment and um, demonstration of mastery, so to speak, right? Um, I think it can be done. I'm not saying that I don't think it can be, uh, but I think that's something to think about. Um, how to go about that right now would involve me thinking deeply, I think, for a little while. Uh, John, Karen, anyone? Thoughts? So I think, this is John, I think that just the idea of um, having as much flexibility as you can, um, but be kind to yourself. Um, they still have to, in some ways, if you can build a rubric that says, for this activity, I don't care how you do it, but I want you to reach these points, that gives them, you know, share three options or, um, three examples, um, have some resources or, or cite some sources, um, make an argument, whatever the, whatever the things that you're looking for, they could do that in a post, they could do that in a paper, they could do that in a video that they create, uh, you know, walking alone outside by themselves, whatever, whatever they can come up with. That, it's up to them to fit whatever they do into your rubric, provided you make your rubric sort of broader than requiring Times New Roman 12 point and one and a half inch margins and um, things like that. So think about how can you have your rubrics nice and broad to be able to give them, to your point, that agency. Because you're right, if the students can feel like this is their learning and that they're in charge of it, that's great. But they have to do that recognizing that you can't do 30 different rubrics for 30 different pieces of work or 300 or however many students you have. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I want to add, you mean, go, go ahead, ahead, Karen. Oh, I was just going to add that I, I, I agree with John that you have to be careful, but I do like the idea of giving, if you have an assignment, that you give them multiple ways to accomplish that assignment. They could uh, either do it a video, audio, text. So you could do it that way, or you could give two options of assignments. That's what we used to do with Teach Online, too, that you would get, you can either do this option or this option. But try to, by making it, you don't want to make it difficult to John's point that it would be really impossible for you to grade and for them to really understand if they're achieving their, the learning objectives either. So just maybe think about a way that you can structure that assignment that they could do it in different ways, different media even, would also be an easy way to do it. Mm -hmm. But go ahead, Karen, I'm sorry. Um, I was just going to add, you know, I was in, I think I was in graduate school. It doesn't matter what I was in, but I did have a class where the instructor did this kind of thing. Now, it wasn't an online class or anything, but I think that's kind of irrelevant to our point right now. Um, and basically, what she had was, oh, I wish I could remember how many options there were, but there were a bunch of different options of activities that were related to the course content. And you could choose from those activities and they were assigned different point values based on their level of complexity. And so one of the high point valued ones was to read a text and write a critical analysis of it, whereas smaller ones were like, go out into your community and find an example of this course concept in practice. And so some of them, like the lower ones, were let's say 10 points each, finding the example in your community. You could do that three times. Um, obviously, the book one and the critical analysis, that was, you could just, it was worth 100 points and you could just do it once because it was just one book. Um, and then there were a range of activities within there. And essentially, the class was just based on point values. So you had to earn X number of points to receive this grade, so on and so forth. And you could mix and match uh, how you did those different options entirely up to you. So I think it's it seems to me that's exactly kind of what you're talking about here. Um, and it, it was really cool. I remember, obviously, <laughs> I thought it was a really neat way to do that. So I think it definitely can be done. It's just a matter of figuring out the how-tos of it all. Um, okay, let's see. I wanted to speak to this number three that's on here. Someone's asking about a group authored project. So this is a really great example of a collaborative activity that 
is not a discussion forum um, and can very easily be asynchronous. In fact, I would maybe argue it would be best to do something like this asynchronous, but at least with some kind of indicator as to topics that different students are researching um, or areas, right? Because if you don't have some clarity in that, people might do the same thing twice, although that's not always that bad either because different people have different takes on things. So, um, but there are a lot of suggestions here. So it's basically what they're doing is curating some kind of resource page. And so what's the best tool to use this? Given concerns about international students, um, particularly if there are students in your course who are in China, Google Suite is off the table. Um, so Microsoft Office 365 has some options. I've used a Pressbook um, in the example I was giving you earlier about group contribution logs in that class, that was their project. They were curating a resource page um, based on a topic that the, each group chose by themselves. And so uh, what we did was we actually had them create a Canvas page, but the shortcoming there, um, we didn't think about students and their post-course access to the work that they created. And there was an issue by creating Canvas pages because once students lose their, once they graduate and lose their WISC accounts, they wouldn't be able to access that work anymore. So what we ended up doing was transitioning it to Pressbook, um, that's suggested in there. And um, I wish we would have started with the Pressbook because students did some formatting things in the Canvas page that were then lost and would have taken some work to fix um, after the fact that, you know, I wasn't, I guess going to do so I want I wish I would have started with Pressbook so that's a really great example but yeah you can use Microsoft Office 365 applications as well um, and Canvas is an option so uh, although you may have issues with permanent access you know you can still copy and paste HTML code from a Canvas page um, but you might lose some formatting keep that in mind any other buddy, anybody else want to share on group curation activities? These are really pretty cool. Has anybody else done these? So I would, I would want to uh, emphasize or add a plus one to the to use Canvas um, as a repository, but mm -hmm. save it as a, a text file. You can copy and paste into Canvas um, the text option, and a lot of the formatting and a lot of the rich text formatting. Um, stays so students can use whatever whatever they want um, to create the individual formats um, the individual pages or chapters um, and they can work together on that in ways that they can figure out on their own using the tools that they use um, but then to bring it all together canvas is a, is a way that I, as I understand that it, it's used, it's uh, available across the world um, and not under the same issues that doesn't have the same issues that Google has in China. Thanks. Marjean? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm thinking also about things that go beyond um, writing, such as making artifacts and, and creating a reflection for that. And taking a picture, and I'm not promoting, I don't mean to promote a non-supported uh, situation here, but perhaps even taking a picture, writing a response, and creating a um, some sort of Pinterest page or using some other curation software um, that students can post to and access later as well. Yeah, great point. So to that point, we had a lab, um, now it's been several years ago, um, where we had somebody from the School of Human Ecology um, who teaches design talked about using Pinterest because Pinterest is a discipline specific tool that they're um, that professionals in the field use. And he had students create Pinterest boards. So that is perfectly fine to be able to do that. Dan? Um, I um, really like the ideas that I'm hearing and what people are saying as possible approaches. Uh, but I really, I feel like they, they make sense for the fall. Um, but in the circumstances we're in, that you know, I, I design collab asynchronous collaborative projects with instructors 
And it was a months long process to put those into place in a way that we really felt that it was fair to bring them out. And a lot of that time was also spent looking at what do we take out of the course to make space for these so that we're not adding on an additional really cool but complex um, project that is just additional time for the students. And so um, especially with the number of new or, or, or maybe un, unfamiliar approaches and technologies that you know have just been brought up in this conversation I feel like it's kind of getting beyond the the what is realistic in the constraints that we're working in and what would be fair to the students especially as it would involve a shift it could involve a shift away from what's already written in the syllabus and that a lot of time needs to be spent doing this in an intentional way in order to make it fair and valid and and um, just realistic and so to to keep those factors in mind I think that's an excellent point Dan. and if it's if it's difficult or and difficult for your students don't do it if you're already doing it if that was already part of your plan and now you have to shift to how do I do this in an asynchronous fashion mm -hmm. instead of in class you've got to give some thought to how to do that um, and yeah as you start thinking about fall and you might hear rumors about what's going to happen in fall these are things to maybe as you do them this semester think about well what am I going to do next semester mm -hmm. and put them just put them on the shelf and let them ruminate I think that's a good point too because I'm hearing from faculty too that I do this project and I do this face to face but now I can't do that in the remote setting so if you are already doing it uh, it, we, we can, you know, brainstorm on ways that you can still continue to do it. But it is uh, a good point, Dan and others here, that we don't want to start brand new things right now, but we we can consider these for the future. But you don't have to throw out what you're currently doing. I think that's a good message of ours: is if you're already doing it, you already have it all planned and all set up and scheduled. You don't have to you don't have to change that plan. It's just how it's delivered might be different. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, maybe we should switch to number two here. So what are best, what are several ways to structure discussions so they do not become rote and boring and just an exercise in gaining the points they need to be considered complete. Use specific prompts, put, group, put in groups that remain static, would changing group membership freshen the conversation or require additional time to form bonds? So I think there's, well, there's several layers to this um, and I think I'll work from what I see as easily most easily addressed uh, to more difficult so this last part requiring um, or changing group membership versus keeping them static I think that one thing we all need to remember is that we have already built some rapport with our students since we've been in a half a semester together already and so um, what we might do in a situation if we were entirely online from the get-go versus how do we maintain uh, our learner engagement as we finish out our semester are two different things to think about. Um, then the decision comes to, okay, well, what is your goal by having group discussions? And if the goal is um, exposure to variety and perspective, then switching up the groups is, is huge value. But if the goal is digging deep, interrogating something, um, or creating some kind of complex solution to a problem, then I feel like perhaps keeping groups together so that they kind of figure out who each other are, how they participate, when they engage, how they think um, has, has more value. So that's a way to think about that. Um, and then in terms of prompts, yeah, Jeannie, go ahead. Um, thanks, uh, Karen. And this is my question. And I was also thinking about what I like to require when I structure my discussions that way is that they don't just say, I think, I feel, I believe, because then they're just talking out of their butts, basically. Um, and they don't have to do any of the reading or the thinking that is grounding them in literature and the best practice and ethical behavior. I want them to be able to. To ground their answers in some of the 
feel that I'm sharing rather than just talking off the tops of their heads, which is the easiest thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Chris, go ahead. Uh, just to comment on that, which um, uh, Jean, I think I was, I answered your question with the, with the link and the reflection, which I, I, I completely agree. And especially telling them if you have just reflection questions, I think, you know, sort of, I believe I totally understand that. But the other aspect of that too would be once you, it, it, when you create your discussion questions, I think it's not just one or two questions you'd have to create. Anytime I had discussions when I was teaching, I'd have about four to five questions that they would answer and it would really be structured from the ground base of Bloom's taxonomy moving through the creating and the evaluation of that. So they're using, so you could really see what they've learned based off what they've read or what they've heard in the lecture and then really kind of building off that into reflection. So depending on, um, and I'm not sure what course you teach, but anytime I taught social studies, because that's what I was teaching for a long time, it was just the basic ground base of what is this content you essentially learned, but then if you were put in the situation, how would you respond to that? And then actually, and I actually use that with uh, Kaepernick's taking the knee sort of situation. So if you were the NFL commissioner, how would you handle the situation, and would it be a political pro would it be a political issue? Which then it actually got into a long mess of discussions, and actually it really helped the engagement. But I totally understand if you just have just a reflection question or two. I, I totally agree with you. Like you can absolutely just have one, you know, one person say, I believe this and that's it. But that's where I, I believe that with discussion boards, it has to be structured with the ground base of blooms moving to the higher level thinking questions. So you could really see the evolution of their thinking from what you've taught them moving into their reflection. Mm -hmm. This is John. I'm going to jump in here as well, if I could. Um, I just shared a link in the chat about um, five tips for running discussions and I think it's important to recognize that when we talk about online discussions I'm, I'm going to use scare quotes here they're so different from face-to-face -face discussions because in face-to-face -face discussions you can see me using you know my little scare quotes here but in an online discussion you don't you can't hear my voice um, go up and down and sound soft or sound aggressive in online discussions it might you know I might use caps to emphasize, but that sounds like yelling, right? They're very different. In face-to-face -face discussions, I don't have time to think a lot about what's, how am I going to respond, but in an online discussion, I can. I can go find resources and buttress my solutions or my responses with sources and citations and examples. Um, and that's way different from a face-to-face -face environment. So keeping in mind what is different in an asynchronous online discussion really helps to structure, um, have some good responses on, on how do I structure those, uh, those, those prompts. Another way to help kind of guide um, what students need to do to receive credit for participation in a discussion forum is how you create a rubric. If you use a rubric and you say things in that rubric, like I'm evaluating for not only your personal response, but that you connect it to the material explicitly and explain that connection. Um, that you, if what you desire is outside, you know, students to go out and find other resources that relate to what they what they write about, um, that they bring in those resources. Um, and then we also have a lot of at the bottom of this document of the activity sheet. There are resources down here. I'm scrolling down to it now. Um, and there is a lot of stuff on here specifically toward discussions. Um, let's see. So there's setting up Canvas discussions. So if you need the technical help, that's up there. But then down in this area, we've got all sorts of stuff about discussions. So discussion prompts to rubrics to that kind of thing. Um, so there's lots of resources here for you to help you figure out what kind, you know, because there's a bunch, it all depends on your goal, the way that you write a prompt. Um, but I think the key thing to remember is that you are, the prompt itself allows for enough organic uh, dialogue to happen. And if, if the prompt is merely identify, define, 
then you're not going to, there's, there is no conversation to be had aside from, yes, I think you correctly said that. <laughs> so just keeping that in mind. And that's the easy part, uh, of course. Um, but there's a lot of resources there for you to explore. JT. Hey, so I was looking at uh, question number five on the activity sheet, and I was wondering if the author of that question um, would like to jump in about some of the challenges with creating um, those dialogues in a foreign language classroom, um, which requires that human element that, you know, everyone necessarily wants to recreate in the online environment, but challenge that faced with uh, the asynchronous situation. I was wondering if that person is online and would like to maybe respond to some of the conversations that we've just been having. Mm -hmm. Yes. Sarah. Go, go ahead, ahead, Sarah. Hi. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, so that was my question. Um, I, I guess what I'm, I guess my question would be um, with oral communication, is a recording better than um, synchronous, you know, synchronous conversation? And what do, you, what are the pros and cons of using a recording versus using, um, like, putting pairs together and having them speak to each other or, or just straight using instructor time to have a conversation with a student for 10, 15 minutes, like oral exams, kind of. And what the pros and cons are, how you might structure it in a way where students are getting practice engaging orally, um, communicating with each other, and yeah, what happens to interpersonal communication when it's oral and asynchronous versus the the discussions that we've been talking about seem to be more written based, and I think that that works really well. And I'm just curious. It's a technical question as well as a like a theoretical question. So, Dan, I, I saw you raise your hand pretty quickly when Sarah was speaking. Did you want to speak to this? Um, yeah, I'd love to, um, because I get to put my language teacher hat on, which is my actual <laughs> academic training. Uh, so um, I would um, I would say there's, there's two things I think about with this question. Is One is that there is, I, I don't believe there is any authentic way to replace conversation with um, an asynchronous activity, but there are plenty of forms of communication that we do naturally in daily life that are asynchronous and that are um, that involve you know all, all kinds of um, approach you know, social media or chat or all, all kinds of other tools that are out there. And so, anytime you're trying to re you're trying to build you know authentic communication between between learners, you, you think, okay, where would I do this in real life? Where would I, where is it, where is it, what's a medium that works that people are still using now and trying to create assignments that then, that where you're not fighting against the medium that you're using, that you're really leveraging it as like, as it's intended. And so getting people to communicate asynchronously, asynchronously is, is possible if you think about where that actually happens. Where are you doing it yourself right now? And then just ask that, you know, craft an assignment where they have to do something that's natural, but in the foreign language. And, and that, I think that's, that's easy. That's something that can be definitely achieved. I'm going to jump in here as well and say that although, and I'm putting my do it AT hat on. So I think I'm going to, I'm going to say this semi-officially. Although there are many tools that campus does not support, there are many tools that disciplines use and students in those disciplines need to learn to use. So if there are tools that are safe and are part of the discipline, I would use them with caveats and, you know, use them carefully and say, hey, students, don't you don't have to get an account on this necessarily. If you can do a guest account and if you can have them use um, pseudonyms and say things and not have them talk about sensitive subjects, if you want them to just practice talking and people learning foreign language practice talking to learn, then do that. Dan, go ahead. 
I, I just said one other thing to it, it, it um, which is if the goal really is to get conversation going, um, in a classroom setting, you know, you got group work is hard to recreate because it requires synchronous communication with, you know, some with a web conferencing type tool. But if it is just communication and you think of pair work as being, you know, good enough for what you're doing, it, students can figure out how they want to do a conversation and find a time that is not during regular class time, but over the course of a whole week. And they can even use a phone to do it. They can use any kind of of, of um, communication app that's out there. And so there's a lot of possibilities if you just step back and say, let the students figure out how they're going to connect, give them a time frame and give them something to talk about and ask them to use the language skills that they have to do it. You know, teaching teaching a foreign language by telephone is is a field. People do that professionally, and that's definitely something that you can continue to do as long as you're not mandating that they use some kind of tool and just giving them choices and letting them navigate that. Elise. Uh, Danielle, I just want to say thank you for that um, last comment. I just want to um, just, just follow up on that. So you're suggesting that the possibility if you were going to do sort of an in-class discussion, um, and obviously we can't do that now, you're saying uh, assign the students the op th that sort of assignment so that they can call each other on the phone, kind of do their group work together, and then when we come back to class, sort of synchronous class, then they can they can report out. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that that's what we're doing in um, one course that I have been supporting. That they have seven hundred plus students, and they are they wanted to keep some level of communication between students. So mm -hmm. they give them the task, and they give them five five days to do it and they expect them to talk for 15 minutes because you know you think about how much time would a student actually spend talking in a 15 minute class is probably not very much so 15 minutes and then they make the tools that are campus supported available so chat on canvas if that's what they want to use they can use blackboard collaborate but they also welcome to use anything else and that's to avoid telling the students that they have to give out their private phone number because they they shouldn't have to uh, but if they feel comfortable doing it, and that's what they prefer to do, or if they prefer to use WhatsApp, or they prefer to use um, FaceTime, or whatever, that that's something that the students who are paired off can choose to do, and they're not mandated to do it. And as long as they're given the topic to talk about and a reasonable amount of time in which to figure out when it works for them, um, then um, it, it's it seems to be a, a good way of of achieving communication but not in the synchronous setting of like, okay, between 9 and 10 a.m., that's when our class was, that's when you're going to do it. Okay, very helpful, thank you. Lauren, Lauren brings up a really interesting point in chat that um, the students, and I think many of us, we would say, yeah, if I, if, I, if I had the choice in normal situations, I would like to do things asynchronously because I am so tired of face-to-face -face meetings that are wasteful, da -da 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 -da. I don't like to go into class, et cetera, et cetera. There's all kinds of reasons that we like to go asynchronous, but now that we're sort of encouraged and forced to do it, or we're socially isolating, we miss the face-to-face. -face. We miss that humanity, that uh, the sound of each other's voices, faces, et cetera. So I think that there's something to that there. Um, I don't disagree, but I will point out that remember there are tools built into Canvas that still allows us to record our faces and our voices. Um, so I just don't want people to forget about that, uh, that it doesn't just have to be text-based, that those are built right into the reply function of a Canvas discussion too. Yeah. So use the, and I guess while, while we're on that, um, Allowing for people to pick and choose the way they want to respond is a good strategy, right? You don't necessarily have to make people record their video. Maybe they prefer to write in, in text form. Um, I've read research about, um, uh, about the kind of perspective from, we'll just say, non-native English speakers and the, the value of being able to write in text and the performance 
pressure that recording video of them speaking can have in an online environment. Um, so I think that I'll, allowing for variation, flexibility there is a, is a good thing, but those tools are there. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Martine. Sandra. Yeah. Um, I just wonder, I haven't tried that video. It's so what's happening in Canvas and video is that they're pre-recording uh, whatever they want to say and then posting it. Uh, to tell you frankly, some of the uh, things that I find online, some of the instructions, it's just I, I just give up on them. It's, I, I don't understand a lot. And I know this is a different um, workshop, but uh, how easy is it for them to, to record? Is it just sure. clicking the record button and that's it and then posting? Yes, there is that option. Um, so part of, I totally hear you, Sandra, there are a lot of instructions out there and um, for what it's worth, Canvas has multiple ways to do the same thing um, and that may be seen as flexible but that also may be seen as confusing. Um, so anyway, um, right above number six on our activity sheet, there's a link for how do I record video using Rich Content Editor as a studio as a studio, as a student. Um, so there's a link right there that shows you exactly where in Canvas you, thank you, they also shared it in the chat, um, how you can do that. But yeah, right in that rich content editor of anything in Canvas, one of the options is a little box with a play button in it, and you can click on that, and you can choose to record just audio or audio and video, and you yeah, you click record, it does three, two, one, you speak, you click stop, and then click save, and then you post your reply, and there it is. So it's it's definitely really easy. Um, but you are right, there is another option where I could record something from my phone, pre-record it, and then just go in there and upload it. Um, but it is easy, there is easier options, so. Right, and Sandra, that also works in speed grader. So if you wanted to give a personal audio comment to one of your students, it works there well as so anywhere in Canvas they have this ability and it adds a bit more of your personal presence. We were talking about that yesterday, the ability to add presence and you can do that using the speed grader as well. That's a good question, Marjean. Um, but I was under the understanding that students didn't have that limit on storage space for submissions. Yeah, and to JT's point, they have doubled the space. Okay. So we now have two gigs of space, but also, Karen, you're right. Um, when we were looking into this, extra comments and such do not eat into that space. I don't know how that magic works, but okay. um, that is, that is, yeah, it doesn't in, eat into that space. One more thing, Basically Sandra. It uploads then that eat into that space. It's the file content yeah. so files and videos that you put into the content rather than in responses that counts okay. against that space one more thing sandra um you're right there are so many directions out there and i just shared a couple of different urls to it but there were um there are also um there are lots of different ways so canvas guides has both videos and text based instructions um, there are also some really good short videos out there created by instructors and tech support folks at different universities. So look around, try different things. If you find somebody that works really well for you, bookmark them or subscribe to their YouTube channel or whatever because um, that's that's good. It's also a good way to ask your students to find those resources to help each other figure that out because it's hard for you, but it might also be hard for them but they are also some, you have some students who are experts at it, who will find resources and share them with each other if you let them. All right. We've got half an hour left here. Are there, JT, go ahead. I'm, I'm thinking now about sort of the multiple means of engagement, sort of Dan's earlier question about the um, obviously the the unprecedented circumstances that we're in, and maybe this is a question that sort of rocks the boat. But is there ever would would anyone envision an instance where they just tell their students contribute how you can for the rest of the semester? You know, we may have these discussion forums or these video chats or these phone 
um, conversations, but if this isn't working for you, um, do whatever it is that you can will make it work. So <laughs> Sandy says, no. Um, and I'm going to say, maybe. I'm going to say, look underneath our how-to section. And I've got a, a point that I'm going to highlight here. And maybe, Karen, you can scroll down a little bit on your screen. Uh, wait, where is this? Steel ideas, there are two things here that are counter to each other. One, your students see many more courses than you do. They are able to um, pull from those courses. Some of those will be fantastic ideas. Some of those will not be good ideas. You need to have that discussion. They should have that discussion. What, what works, what doesn't work? Um, Margaret asked a question in the what do in the activity sheet about what do students or what do instructors need to know about tools and activities that might infringe on student privacy or FERPA. Students need to know this too, right? We don't want them to just go out and copy people's stuff and share it out willy-nilly. Um, so have those conversations. Some of them might be a, somebody might come up with a really good idea that you've never thought of that would work great and be safe and private. Open it up to them. Ask those questions. If not, if it doesn't work, at least they know why this might not work and why you're not saying, well, let's just do everything on Reddit or let's open up a, yeah, a subreddit or let's do things on Snapchat. At least having that discussion primes them for, oh, that's why we're not doing this super easy, super obvious answer um, solution. But also then to Sandy's point, be easy on yourself. Um, you've got to do things that make sense to you as well, you're still the instructor of the class. Um, just be transparent about why um, you're making the decisions that you are. Thanks, John, good points. Let's see, so um, other, let's, we've gone through some of the big ones up here. Um, a few of these have pretty clear answers provided for people, so I didn't address them. Um, are there other ones, and anybody want to bring up a, specific situation or question or share a particularly effective thing you've done, anything like that. Go ahead and either speak or raise your hand. I'll call on you. Uh, Sandy. Yeah, one thing that I decided to do um, is not great um, the uh, the post that the students are doing because they are required, were required when uh, we had the face-to-face -to, -face to participate. And uh, I've assured them that, first of all, they don't need to be stressing out over grades. This is a literature course. I've made some changes. Uh, one of the things that was that they were to do an eight to 10 page uh, paper. This was to teach them how to do scholarly writing with you know, a, a, a critical essays and footnotes and all of that. That has changed. <laughs> they now are doing a uh, very short two page three two page papers where they're commenting and get doing a specific thing on each of the three novels that we have left. A student uh, uh, emailed me and said that when she left she did not have access to she didn't bring all of her books and she couldn't find one of them. It's Song of Solomon by Toni Morrison. It's an audible book. They can listen. So these are the changes that I'm making. But in terms of um, the asynchronous uh, work, once I shed, got rid of the idea that I needed to be an expert on this, it's moving much more smoothly. The group All sessions, right. I mentioned this yesterday, the group sessions worked well. Uh, the, uh, and, and there are a couple of other things. By the way, I record a lecture and, um, and I, I post it on Saturday night so that they can have it. One big mistake, I'm sorry, I love Invisible Man. I talk for an hour and a half. That's too damn long for anybody. Uh, I won't do that again. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm becoming more comfortable with this, but on the other side of it, I do have to keep reminding myself, I'm not an expert, but this is the beginning. And then later on, I can take some of these trainings that will, you know, make it more smoothly. But the first week and a half was awful. I mean, not awful, but, you know, that stress of thinking I got to do this just right. Now I'm settling into uh, we're going to make it through. Thank you for everything, everybody. Awesome to hear, Sandy. And and think about ways like, all right, so normally you would talk about the Invisible Man for an hour and a half or for as long as you can. Um, 
how can you set up different threads and discussions to address the different themes that you would normally talk about? Um, what are the ways that you can break that up so that you don't have to like edit yourself down for this? You know, you, you want to share out the richness of it. You also want to make sure that the students recognize that they don't have to do, we've been talking lately about a course and a half, right? Putting things online um, can tempt us to adding into adding more material than we normally would. But on the other hand, you don't want to withhold material that you normally would share with them as well. So what's that happy medium and, and how can you do this in asynchronous ways? Sandy, I there just wanted to follow up with your question. Oh, oh go ahead, John. I didn't mean to. No, go ahead, Sarah. Something to add. Karen. So when you said that you, uh, how are the discussions going then? You said they're going better. Are they all participating now still? Or how is that going without providing any points or anything now that you've eased up on it? How is it? You said it's gone well? It's going better, uh, but I had to think about the construction of the class, the real class, because you know I've been teaching for 30 years, and in these last couple of years, I find that the students are so unconnected with each other. You know, as I mentioned yesterday, they are all on their phones or on their devices when I walk into the room, and I'm sure other people have this experience. I have a, 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 a my is a this is a device free zone turn them off when i come in they turn them off but they're not talking to each other it's a struggle even when i you know i was in the dis discussion project to try to find new ways to to teach uh and i tried out some of those things but then when we go back they fall back into their own little uh i don't know manner of not even communicating with each other I realize that. And so now I'm saying, I had to say to myself, I can't make this change online, uh, but I can do some things. But using the groups last uh, on Monday was helpful. But what I'm also seeing is the same people who talked in class, who uh, contributed to discussions, are the same ones that are doing some, you know, or, or maintaining that kind of engagement online. So what I do want to try is get some of these people who are a little less quiet. Um, who don't contribute too much to facilitate some little small something, uh, you know, to get them engaged. And then with the um, with the group sessions that I had, there I know who they are, the, the ones who don't like to speak, because they even said, this one woman said she doesn't like to speak at all in class, uh, in discussions, unless she's forced to, and we don't force people to do things. And so uh, in, our, in, in one of the groups, when she was in the group, I kept sending her a little notice, uh, can you give me some other ideas of whatever it was we were talking about, what the prompt was? Um, you know, Megan, can you can you reply again? Can what else can you you know? So so I was encouraging her without forcing her, and she came up with some stuff. One of the things that they said they like about this is that they have time to think, and they're those yes. who write are writing some really nice stuff. Thank you. So, right, that's why I was going to point out the resource. Thank you. I think Karen might be scrolling to it, on how it's really nice in a discussion forum to give people roles, so people who maybe. Yes haven't normally talked or give information, if you provide certain roles, maybe you're a, a critic or maybe you're the writer, you could give them different roles because you're an English course, right? So maybe you could give them roles that they might have in the real world and then break them into groups and then that might add to getting people to talk, uh, discuss when they may not normally because they have a role. I'm the critique person in this one or I'm the contributor. If you give them a role, that might create some uh, engagement as well. And with literature, that could work out really well. Like, think of the different characters in the different books, not just the same book, but across literature piece to literature piece. Say, how would so and so respond to this? How would somebody else respond to this? Make them the authors. Speaking from Ellison's view, how would you answer this question? Speaking from somebody else's view, what would you say if you assign them to be the roles? They don't have to be themselves. And I think that that's a big part of students are afraid to interact with each other as themselves. But if you say, oh, no, you're, we're going to play, you know, dress up right now and you play the role of somebody else, they have to get inside that character or that author or that person's brain and respond as them. And that that solves a lot of the um, uncertainty or the, the fear of, of 
what if I say something that will offend my student colleague? Yes, we have a music instructor, Jamie Hankey, who does that extremely well, has them talk as Beethoven. And instead of the discussion forum, she does it in a, uh, in a blog. So they, instead of doing the, using the Canvas discussion forum, so they write as that author. So they have to research, I mean, that musician. They have to research that musician, and uh, they talk as that musician in the blog. And uh, she found that really helped. Well, like, what if, what was, if they were on yeah. social media as friends, Bach and Beethoven and Tchaikovsky, et cetera? It's interesting. Yeah. It's wonderful. You can make it fun. Yeah, can make it fun that way. Any other questions people have we want to discuss? I see Sarah and JT have been having conversations on the side here. Um, can you share what you learned in your conversation on the side? JT, go ahead. I learned that. Uh, Sarah has always the best questions. Um, and I, I think, Sarah, I think the, the thought process and thought experiment that you're having right now about a creative way of nuancing a rubric in the event that you know you have a student or a group of students who just can't access materials in some way. And I. I don't know. Um, I'm sure maybe others that are in the chat or in the in the call as well um, definitely have ways of sort of responding to those situations. Um, I think it's definitely a question to have. Um, yeah, and Sarah, go ahead. Yeah, I was thinking about um, ways to. So I think it, it would it would have to happen on multiple levels. Where um, I forget who said it at first, but. Um, making the discussion multimodal would allow for students to say, so I didn't participate in this area because X, Y, Z, but I did participate in this area, and so I would like to get credit for that. And I wonder how much we could make a rubric more of like a holistic participation yeah. rubric that isn't, it's not, um, did you, part did you, it's not, did you contribute three times? Did you... Um, you know, it's not like the typical rubric that we would use in participation. Sorry. Um, sorry, my neighbors are sawing wood and it's probably <laughs> <really> loud. <laughs> um, um, but changing the rubric somehow to allow for students to contribute their, to, to highlight their strengths yeah. in a way, rather than say, um, did you meet this requirement or not? Um, mm -hmm. And I'm wondering too if like a rubric isn't just a one, two, three, four, five, but is more of like a short answer kind of rubric well, they, even for itself. It's a discussion of um, here I can even like cite myself and say, I actually posted this insightful, um, yeah, I know there's so many birds. I'm so sorry, I'm outside. <laughs> um, <laughs> there, <laughs> um, like, Cite, uh, cite yourself where you think you contributed well and get points for that. Or, you know, something for students to, to um, determine Problem where solved. they... Yeah. One thing I, I was thinking something... of would... Go ahead, JT. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that I was thinking of, Sarah, is that sort of single point rubric um, where they define their strengths and their weaknesses based around our clearly... or based around the learning objectives that are already listed in the syllabus. Um, so as a way, you know, they can describe that um, that alternative way that they contributed in a significant way, even if they weren't able to, you know, do three discussion posts, but they were able to provide, you know, a lot of other resources, or they were able to post a longer video or something like that. I don't know, just sort of that free form comment area that's always articulated around an objective might maybe be useful. I'm not entirely sure, but I, I love the birds, though. Tie this back to uh, the the. Um, Sandy, Sandra mentioned that one of her students le left her book at in her rest hall or lost it or somehow, um, but there's an Audible book for it. I think that the idea of letting students help each other solve some of these problems is a great way to get, we should, we should give them credit for doing that. And that would also, I think, to um, Sarah, uh, Sandra's uh, dilemma, that would help them encourage them to talk to each other a little bit more and to build some of that trust.
trust that they used to have maybe before they had cell phones where they could connect with people outside of the classroom, they would connect with people inside the classroom. So what can we do to structure them to help each other solve these problems as well? Daniel? Uh, Dan. Thanks, Sean. Um, I was just thinking about from um, the, the problem that Sandy brought up um, and reminded of what I found very helpful in a, an English as a second language classroom in uh, looking at academic texts. And that's the, old, that's the approach of reading circles. And there was a specific version of it called academic reading circles that I used for years and my wife has also continued to use, where you structure, the, people have five roles where each of them is contributing from a different perspective. So they're building their understanding together because they're bringing in, um, they, they've done the reading looking at one particular aspect of it and the five aspects that they, that they bring together are, you know, each person knows something the others don't know, and the five aspects of it together create a more holistic understanding of the text. And there's a lot of versions of reading circles. I'll post in the chat um, a link to a Prezi that I put together for one that, um, that I use in the ESL classroom. And then I've also been finding, because it originally came from literature teaching, um, I'm finding other versions of it online that are more adapted to teaching literature rather than academic texts. Um, but this is a good opportunity to think about how um, you know, some of these approaches that w in the face-to-face -face setting do put the responsibility onto the students to be autonomous and to guide their own discussion work really well in this setting where we're no longer face-to-face -face and we're no longer able to be central to their discussion or to lead it in real time. And so I think that there's a lot of scope with that kind of approach. So. Go ahead, Margaret. Make sure you add your- Hey, Jen. Yep, can you hear me? Yep, we can, thank you. Okay, super. Um, thanks, Dan, I, I really appreciate the insights. I'd, I'd like to step back to, uh, to John's comment about how, to, how can we reward students uh, for helping each other, and I think uh, there's a way to do this, and it sort of reminds me of our uh, universal design thing where we do some self-directed um, rubrics. The, the learner can decide what they're willing to contribute and how best to contribute it, but I would say more importantly, it reminds me of um, the Wisconsin experience uh, in empathy and understanding, and why not have some place in the syllabus for that, where we're able to actually help people, whether it's to get them the audio book or, you know, help help them set up something on their computer or just express some, you know, humility, understanding. How how can we say, hey, you know what? As part of our class, we have this this like a community trust, and and we need to all work together to build this trust. And people get credit somehow for that. I I don't know if I should say credit because it almost simplifies it but I, I think you get my point well there's a social credit too as well as the point credit right and that's something that everybody's looking for that's what i mean yeah yeah gene go ahead hi thanks um i'm uh, responding before margaret started talking to what dan was saying before and i posted in the chat something called the six thinking hats which is another oh, yeah. way of structuring how people um, contemplate their own preferred thinking style in a group so that you require people almost to identify what their comfort zone is and then you specifically get them out of their zone and put them in an uncomfort zone or discomfort zone um, so that for a purpose of conversation and I think this could work in any course specifically it, it's often used in business I use it in social work um, to help people approach decision-making problems that they're struggling with. But it's um, there's a whole bunch of stuff on it, and if, if you look up the six thinking hats, you'll find it. It's a, it's a really intriguing way um, to ask students to think about themselves and about the task that you've set for them. Anyway, just Great. to read. Good. All right, Peter. 
Um, I, sh I shared a, in the resources a, an article that was in the New York Times magazine from a number of years ago about, um, you know, an, an endeavor that Google undertook to figure out kind of like what makes groups of people work together skillfully, while as, whereas other, pe other groups don't really work. And so um, it's very interesting because it, it kind of relates directly towards the idea of um, social sensitivity and the idea of um, speaking versus listening, that there should be a balance, you know, like all the skills that would be required to create an environment of psychological safety um, that relates directly to, you know, the comments that, you know, and the things that we've been talking about in, over these last couple of minutes. And so I, I recommend um, taking a look at that as well. Yeah, I remember reading that article uh, years ago. Thank you. All right, well, we have 14 minutes left. Um, any other thoughts that people have? Took the words right out of my mouth, John. Sarah. Hi again. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the time investment um, and whether you think that more time is invested into asynchronous learning than synchronous and um, I, I guess I'm thinking of it as like the most effective asynchronous learning right now seems to um, be something that we should think about a lot for the fall as we've said and I'm, I'm just trying, trying to uh, find what's the best use of time for now and prioritize that. Sure. It, it's a hard thing to answer, Sarah. I think that just like anything, um, that you could set one thing up and some students may spend more time uh, going down the proverbial rabbit hole than others, right? So some learners may engage at the minimum and put little time into things just as they could do incidentally in a face-to-face -face classroom. I mean, arguably, just because they come to our room doesn't mean they're paying any attention attention or investing any energy into listening to us, right? Um, and I think it, that that same issue is present even in an asynchronous environment, uh, that some people may follow every optional link and, you know, do more than others. But I don't think there is an inherent more or less answer. Um, I think it's about individual learners more than it is anything. Um, could you design an environment that could lend itself to more time being spent, more energy being invested? Sure, I think so. I think that if you provide all sorts of jumping off points just to make it a rich environment, you've certainly created an environment where you could spend more time and invest more energy versus one that's just read chapter one, two, and three, here's your quiz, right, obviously. Um, nonetheless, you're asking about where is the best place to prioritize right now. And I think it, if it were me, my answer would be what are my learning goals, my, my course outcomes, the big things that I wanna make sure my students leave this classroom having a grasp of. And that's where I'd put my energy and focus on it. And whether I do that asynchronously or synchronously, um, I think is going to depend on the instructor, their 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 comfort level with doing it either way, right? I mean, um, some people may have more comfort doing it asynchronously versus synchronously. I mean, that's everybody is individual there, but that's where my focus and my priority would be, would be to make sure that I'm going to help my students grasp those key things. I'm going to jump in here as well and, and suggest that there is no ideal way mm -hmm. um, because what is ideal for you may be totally terrible for somebody else mm -hmm. and what is ideal for somebody else might be absolutely unacceptable for you. 
So what are the ways, what are the happy mediums, and how many different, as Karen said, uh, different ways for can we set up for students to involve, or jumping off points, I think was the, the phrase that she used, so that they can say, all right, of these 10 things that are set up here, these are no good, but this one's, this one I can maybe do, and let's give it a try. If it doesn't work for me, well, then there's this one over here that I could try out. So I think a lot of it, you know, you'll find if you put out 10 things, which is probably too many things to do at once, but at least giving a couple of people some choices, that's a step in the right direction for right now. And in fall, maybe in fall, you'll have five choices. Maybe next spring, you'll be, oh, this is so easy right now. I, I never want to teach synchronously again or face-to-face -face again. I'm going to have 10, 10 ways to do things, 10 ways for people to play the game of school, of collaborative learning, um, and we'll get it all figured out at that point. But for now, two, maybe three. Do what you can. What I like to think about when I'm working with people in Teach Online is what is the big idea you want them to learn from that course? What do you really want them to know and understand after they complete this course? And then what do I want them to know and understand after I complete this module? And really think through, are they getting that big idea? And can you articulate that idea to your students and make sure that whatever you're doing is meeting that and whatever isn't? isn't necessary, isn't necessary to do. And, you know, do you, so that's, if you think about it that way, what you really want them to achieve from the session, that might help you narrow down. I also try to, but it's hard to do, try to guess how much time or try to get a feel for how much time I think it might take them to do an activity and list that. But that's hard to do because for us as instructors, we probably can do it twice as fast. So you might obviously want to add some time, but think of, now how long is that going to take them to do that? Because we're hearing about this course and a half. And it's because as instructors, we want to provide so much information because we love our content, we love our ideas. So it's hard to give up some of that stuff. And But think about what do you really want them to achieve and accomplish and how much time will it take them to do that? And also ask them. So step zero in backwards design is know your students, right? Once you know their students, then together you work on your learning objectives. They're not just your learning objectives. They're also what does the department want you to do? What does the next what do others in your department want you to do? What do the students want to learn? What are their paths? They don't know yet necessarily what their paths are. So you have to sort of be open to how can I, how can an objective be help them find their path? And that involves some exploration of the system so that they fail some ways in ways that don't kill them or, you know, damage their career. And success, right? We want success because success builds off of success. So being open to what they want to learn and need to learn and need to explore in order to understand what they need to learn is also part of the learning objectives. Thank you so much. Yeah. So we have seven minutes left. Are there any questions on the activity sheet that we have not answered or people want a little bit more um, discussion about around? Does anybody have a new plan now for the rest of the semester? There is so much to process. You're right, Margaret. And it's a totally different uh, it's a, than what we're used to, right? Yeah. I want to remind everybody that on the instructionalcontinuity.wisc.edu site, there are other labs and webinars happening this week. There are also um, online sessions for Blackboard Collaborate and for Canvas. And somebody help me, there's another one that I'm not thinking of. No, two? Just those two. And those I wouldn't two. really call them sessions. They're kind of drop-in office hours. Thank for you. We've got one room for Blackboard Collaborate Ultra and one for Canvas tools generally. Um, so those are, uh, as an FYI, those are open from 3 to 5 o'clock, um, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, at least this week and next week, um, possibly beyond that. But they are just drop-in, ask your questions, get some help kind of things. I had noticed on the activity sheet that we had a couple of questions about how do you do breakout rooms in Blackboard Collaborate, or can we do, I forgot what the other one was, but also technical style questions. Um, 
And those are really great places to um, get some of that help and get some practice, some actual hands-on practice. Um, whereas the labs here, we end up talking a lot more about how am I going to solve this problem? Mm -hmm. All right, Peter. <laughs>